So good evening, everybody. Um, I will keep this brief, but I do want to say it. It's lovely to uh, be asked to moderate an event here, and I do one every month. But I met Jeremy Hunter 20 years ago when we were both younger. He was extremely handsome then, as he is now. <laughs> and I was employed by his brother. And I remember this man, Jeremy, bumbling around with a camera all the time. And now all of us in the room have a camera. Uh, but back then, when I met him, I didn't. And I was 20, and he was 30. And he kept, everywhere he went, he had his camera. So I can attest to the fact that this man is obsessed with photography. And so it's a great joy, and I can tell you I've seen his work, and I've been lucky enough to know his family for this time. So what I intend to do is to prod him a bit, but also stop him talking so he, we can look at his photographs and then open it up to you in sections. So uh, the first opportunity to have a go with Jeremy will be after he shows us his North Korea photos. And that's your first opportunity in about 15 minutes. But welcome, everybody. Rest assured, it's your chance in a moment. Jeremy, um, welcome to the Frontline Thank Club. Thank you very much for uh, being invited, um, Flora and, and Paddy. You're still a very active person. I understand you came here by scooter, but your bike didn't start. Your that battery was flat. You so I walked. But you've put on a tie, but you are actually what I would call an, a sleeves-up, dirty business type of person. I'm, I, well, that, absolutely right, but I have to say that um, years ago I used to work with a very, very famous photographer called Terence Donovan. Um, and Terry always used to have uh, identical suits and ties and shoes. And I would say to Terry, why, why do you do that? And he would say, well, so I don't have to make a decision about what to wear in the morning. <laughs> so I'm simply following in the, in the footsteps of one of the greatest photographers of the last 50 years. We're going to see your work. Um, now, I've mentioned you carried a photograph camera with you, a stills camera, but actually you were employed early on in your career as a filming producer reporter. Correct. So you carried a camera almost as an adjunct. You weren't meant to, you just went with it. Yeah, I mean what is quite interesting is, is I mean I've, I've shown um, this uh, presentation um, all over the world and every time that I show it, people ask me, well, how did I get involved with it? Well, I have to say that I started actually life as a photographer when I was 20. Um, and then sort of through the, through the years, um, I became a television producer. And then I got made redundant in the 1970s. This was actually the time of the, um, the miners' strike and uh, Edward Heath had gone to the, the country and um, he had lost. Uh, and uh, uh, production uh, and, uh, and, all, and related um, uh, businesses sort of ground to a halt. And I was out of a job. And uh, I decided that um, I would uh, actually look in the Guardian media section, which I did. And for about two months, I looked every Monday, and nothing came up. And then one day, there was an advertisement. It said, foreign TV station requires TV producer, French-speaking essential, right to this box number, which I did. Never heard a word for about another couple of months. And then one day, I got a phone call, rather distant, bad line, um, with somebody saying, please come to Tehran. So I said, why? And I was told, well, you, you've applied for this, uh, for this job. So I flew to Tehran. And uh, uh, I was told that there would be somebody to meet me at the airport. Well, in fact, there wasn't. So I gathered my things. And this was about 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, and walked out, and eventually somebody came up to me with a very strong Geordie accent. And, uh, and, and that was the Shah? Uh, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was an emissary of the Shah. Oh. <laughs> and the emissary's name was, was, was Sid. And I said to Sid, um, am I taking over from you? And Sid said, I've just come back from the fall of Saigon. Uh, I found it absolutely terrifying. I always thought I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. But having been in Saigon, I decided that actually it was far too dangerous. And that what I wanted to do was actually to become a darts correspondent. That is correct, a darts correspondent. And this, this gentleman from, uh, from Gateshead was called Sid Waddell. And Sid Waddell is today one of the most famous darts reporters in the world. He's, yeah. the, he's the person who always shouts 180. So you can see this could be a long night. Uh, everybody, you've come. We want to see your photographs, but you've explained that by answering an ad in the Guardian, you ended up with the Shah of Tehran. I ended. I ended up as a television reporter in Iran, working for a station called NIR TV. I was not the only English person working there. After Sid Waddell, David Frost was working there, uh, and also a very famous um, uh, executive from the BBC was called Tony Isaacs who previously to working in, in Tehran had been executive producer of The World About Us. Um, so anyway, I, uh, 
I was there. I didn't do anything for the first two weeks. And eventually, the executive producer came in, and he said to me, uh, he said, you've been to Alaska. And I said, yes, I have been to Alaska. He said, well, then you're prepared to go to the North Pole. So I said to him, what are we going to do in the North Pole? He said, we will be the first TV crew from Iran to go to the North Pole. And when you've been to the North Pole, you can go to the South Pole. <laughs> so the crew, who were all Iranian, said to me, it's going to be a bit cold. I said, yes, it will be a little bit cold. Um, but uh, I'm sure we can, uh, we can deal with that. So we got everything together. This was at about 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, a few hours later, um, the executive producer came back and he said, where did I say you were going? I said, North Pole. He said, mm, you can do that next week. He said, I think, you'd, I think you should go to Australia tonight to interview Malcolm Fraser, who was then the Prime Minister. So I went back to the crew and said, uh, you're lucky. We're not going to be in the cold. We're going to stay in the warm. And also, there will be plenty of jingle. Um, I did what? Plenty of jingle. The Iranians were absolutely obsessed by meeting jingle. Jingle was a euphemism for women. Oh. Um, uh, not so, jangle, then? No, jingle. Jingle. So I said, yes, there may well be some jingle in Australia. So we got everything together for Australia. And then about 7 o'clock in the evening, I got some airline tickets. And I looked at them and opened the first page, because these were the days before e-tickets. And the first uh, page, it said, uh, Tehran, Delhi. So I went back to the executive producer and I said, oh, I thought we were going to Australia. He said, no, no, no. He said, I want you to go to Delhi and interview Indira Gandhi. Well, uh, prior to that, I had actually never interviewed anybody in my life. Um, and so uh, being sent to interview Indira Gandhi, I have to say, was the most terrifying thing that I had done prior to that, because being responsible for 900 million people's lives um, was, uh, was really something that, uh, that I, was difficult for me to get my head around. Anyway, I got through that. Um, and then for the next two years, um, every week, I would go around the world uh, photographing and reporting on the stories of the, of, of, of the week. As part of that, I actually took my camera with me, and frequently I would get to some remote part of the world, and I would talk to the fixer, and the fixer would say to me, um, "Oh, actually, if there's, a, if you've got time, there's an interesting festival or a celebration, perhaps 60 miles away, 60 kilometres away." And so I started building up this incredible archive of material. And 35 years later, and 65 countries, um, I've now got an archive of material which I think is pretty historic. Um, because so many of the celebrations that I've been to, I think, will probably not uh, continue in the, in the near yeah. future. But, but so, I mean, you've, you, you, you clearly explained that you, so you're a passionate photographer and you took your camera with you, even though you had this fab, fabulous filmic job. And that's why I'm going to ask you to pause so we can start seeing the work for ourselves. And it's to explain that, you know, Jeremy's become convinced that what he's captured is dying and that through what we're going to see, we learn the DNA of countries which we can't often go to, and there's a threat from globalization and social networking and everything else, and the internet, bluntly, to have one sort of monoculture, for, especially for people with cameras. So we're, we're going to start with the thought that what we're going to see is endangered, and we should never have been allowed into North Korea. Certainly a man like Jeremy should never have been allowed there. And uh, he went there just before Kim Jong-il died. So Jeremy, can we start with North Korea? Perhaps if you keep your comments on each slide provocative, then the audience can have a chance to poke you with a big stick. OK. But uh, let's start with your images. Yeah. Um, just, but just before that, um, there is a little kind of intro which I'll play for you, which really gives you a kind of snapshot of some of the things I've been doing over okay. the last well, 35 just put years. The lights it down. runs two minutes. Yep. The audio will emerge, I think, as it starts. Our friend should be able to deal with this. There is music behind it, but... Don't worry, Let, we'll, we'll keep watching, we'll while, just keep watching while the hamsters deal with this.
Now, those are slides without commentary from all over the world. So they set the scene for what we're about to see. Uh, sorry if we didn't hear the, the music there. But let's go into your commentary on each slide from North Korea. Right. Um, I was very fortunate in being able to get into North Korea just before Kim Jong-il died. I'd been trying for a year. Uh, I'd, I'd tried to go officially through the embassy here and got turned down. And eventually found there was a group in Beijing who would enable me to, to get in. And before we just get into the images of why I specifically went to North Korea, which was for a truly extraordinary celebration called Arirang, I'm just going to do a little bit of scene setting. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you will know that um, uh, Kim Il-sung was the founder of, uh, of the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Um, and he became president in 1948. And he remained president as the eternal leader until 1994. And when you arrive in Pyongyang, um, you will see, in fact, there's nobody there. Um, but there is an enormous picture of, of the eternal leader uh, in pride of place. Um, this is, I think, one of the most extraordinary buildings I've ever seen. It's actually it's an unfinished hotel in Pyongyang that was built in 1984 by an Egyptian company um, who ran out of, in fact, the North Koreans didn't pay them, so they were never able to finish it. It actually is a building that is 1,100 feet tall. It was, the, at the time, the tallest hotel building in the world. It actually doesn't have any uh, flaws in it. Uh, and I, what I find interesting about this is that uh, when George Orwell wrote um, his novel 1984 in 1948, he wrote about this fictitious uh, uh, area called Oceana. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that if he had lived to visit the DPRK, he would have felt that perhaps Oceana was replicated in North Korea. There are, no, there's no transport in, in, uh, in North Korea other than a subway. There's nobody on the streets. And that is very, very typical of that sort of uh, Soviet concrete architecture. Everywhere you go, there are images of, uh, of Kim Il-sung. In fact, there is a department uh, in uh, Pyongyang um, that comprises 700 artists. And they are commissioned to paint uh, portraits of either the eternal leader or the great leader, or in fact the new leader, who is going to, who, Kim Jong Un, who is now called the sagacious leader. And somebody worked out that there were 36,000 images of either Kim Il Sung or Kim Jong Il uh, dotted around North Korea. Just as a as a comparison, uh, in France, Joan of Arc, who's the patron saint of of France, uh, has only 20,000 in total. And uh, North Korea is only about the size of Wales. So uh, everywhere you go in North Korea, you see images of the, the great leader or the, uh, the dear leader, as we have there. As I say, I was very fortunate to be able to get in just before he died. Um, North Korea has a million in the military. It has reserves of nine and a half million. And um, throughout uh, North Korea, uh, it's very difficult not to find that the, the military are, um, are everywhere. And everywhere you go, you are subjected to uh, images also of, um, of the US, who are the uh, imperial aggressor. And as you can see here, this is actually an image from uh, uh, 1950, the Korean War. Um, this is actually a, a diorama um, that they built, um, very, very realistic. Um, and as we will see in a moment, uh, you, get, um, you get these continuing images of, of US prisoners. Uh, you can go down to the, uh, the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. Uh, you can, in fact, stand in front of South Korea. Uh, this is a gentleman who allows you to go and do that. Um, and what is interesting is actually being able to stand uh, and look at South Korea, which is only about uh, 20 yards away. 
um, and you have, you have South Koreans standing in a sort of taekwondo um, uh, stance while the North Koreans look like that and are, um, uh, are standing there to ensure that uh, nobody could possibly get across this tiny little border. But in fact, stretched across um, the, the demilitarized zone, you've got, you've got a million um, uh, waiting in attendance for the imperial aggressor to rise up against them. Okay, this is what I went for, Arirang. Arirang is a celebration that takes place in August. Uh, it's held in a stadium which is the largest in the world. It seats 150,000 people. Everything about dictatorships, particularly extreme dictatorships like North Korea, they insist on the, that everything should be the biggest. So they have the biggest stadium in the world. They also have um, something called the Victory Arch, uh, which is a replica of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. But being North Korean, it's actually twice as big. This is uh, the beginning of Arirang. This is 50,000 teenagers who are about to put in front of them uh, their flip charts. And they use flip charts to create some truly extraordinary mosaics like that. Uh, the, um, the kids who are involved in this, they actually work full time. They rehearse from February to August, 10 hours a day. Somebody worked out that in order to, to create this, an image like this, they spend 250 million man hours rehearsing the, um, the, 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 the makeup of these, of these um, mosaics. Um, red is significant. Red is, is significant because it represents the, uh, the workers. There, in fact, there are three classes in North Korea. There are the workers, there are the peasants, and the intellectuals. Um, most of these kids who are performing will probably be uh, the sons or daughters of the intellectuals. Um, and they all have come from Pyongyang. Only, only those in Pyongyang are allowed to live there who have been checked out and have been noted as to being loyal to the regime. What is interesting about this is that in the top right-hand corner, you have a mosaic of a flower. Now, Kim Jong-il decided that for his 42nd birthday, he would have a begonia created specially by a Japanese botanist. So he went, uh, he brought this Japanese bot botanist in, and this botanist created uh, a begonia, which is in fact not the national flower of, 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 of DPRK, because the national flower is actually a magnolia. Um, and the botanist was brilliant because he was able to create this begonia um, that would flower on only on the great leader's birthday, which is February the 22nd. Quite an achievement. Especially for the magnolia. Especially for the magnolia. Um, this, I find, is an extraordinary uh, mosaic. It is actually the uh, Pyongyang skyline, again created by, by flip charts. Um, in the middle, you have this tower. The tower is significant um, because it's called the Juche Tower. And uh, Kim uh, Il-sung created the Juche ideology, which, which uh, promoted uh, self-reliance and independence. Let me just turn that down. Uh, again, uh, with dictators, of course, they're able to achieve anything because they've got um, enormous sums of money to put towards these things. The tower is actually 550 feet high. It's the, of course, it is one of the biggest in the world. It's actually the second highest tower of its kind in the world. Um, and it comprises 25,500 granite blocks. Why? Because 365 times 70, which was the age of Kim Il-sung when he uh, commissioned it, adds up to 25,500 granite blocks. So that was uh, simply uh, produced for his, for his uh, 70th birthday. What you find in North Korea is that, of course, there are enormous sums of money that are put towards these completely um, appalling edifices. Um, when you travel through Ethiopia, you find that there's terrible, terrible starvation. You see people um, gathering grass, which they use to add to their, to their diet. Um, and with the Zhuxi ideology, of course, Kim Il-sung talked about um, reunification with uh, South Korea. 
somebody uh, worked out that in fact it would cost something like 1.7 trillion dollars for North and South Korea to be unified and of course it's uh, highly unlikely in my opinion that it'll ever happen because uh, North Korea does not actually produce anything it has no resources um, and, and I think that the status quo will continue uh, for some time to come and perhaps uh, Kim Jong-un will, uh, will use his, um, or, uh, exercise his muscles and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there was some kind of intrusion into South Korea in the, in the near future. Um, so there again you have the army at the bottom and you have this vast number of uh, uh, teenagers at the top. Uh, what is interesting about the graffiti um, is that it says something along the lines of um, in, in DPRK, there's nothing that we cannot achieve through unity. And I showed this image to somebody who's a friend of mine who was actually a cabinet minister um, in a previous government. And he said, I find this image one of the most chilling I've ever seen because it does demonstrate that DPRK can produce anything with the resource that they have the resource being human people. Um, and of course, because of the, um, the way that they employ their, their, that human resource, um, we've seen that, uh, that they, can, um, they have the resources to be able to create uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons as we have uh, as, as seen over the past uh, uh, couple of years. This is another interesting shot. This is, um, I didn't know what this was until I got back to England. It's actually an apple farm. It's a sort of fantasy world because um, uh, North Korea is supposed to be one of the largest producers of apples in the world. Um, there's some chart that I found uh, that said that DPRK was the 18th largest producer of apples in the world. That, that added up to 650,000 tons of apples. But you never actually see any apples on the street. You don't see any shops. Uh, it's impossible to buy anything at all, particularly sort of food resources, because in North Korea, everybody is rationed when they go. Uh, they, they, can't, they don't actually go to a shop to buy anything. They have to go to a distribution center where, depending upon their status, I, I, if they're workers, peasants, or intellectuals, they will receive a, uh, a box of, of basic requirements, staple uh, foods for a period of a month. So this is, a, this is, a, this is an image of, of an apple farm, which I personally don't believe uh, exists. Um, again, what I've, is extraordinary is the way that they've been able to create this perspective of an apple farm using flip charts. Um, they use, if everybody's uh, sort of into physics, they use a trapezoidal graph. I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, they obviously are able to, to spend inordinate amount of time creating things that are actually no benefit to anybody at all, like this image. Um, again, uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant the way they've been able to create shadows again through through flip charts, but the the foreground comprises um, hundred thousand people. And again, what I find truly amazing is that that each of these scenes lasts just a few minutes, and then it goes to black, and suddenly you will get you know fifty thousand people who just disappear off the bottom of the of, of of the arena. Where they go to, I don't know, because it happens in, in black. And then, then a new image comes through, and you get something like that. And it all happens in a split second. And again, the background changes in a split second as well. Quite incredible coordination. Mm. Um, again, I didn't know what this was until I got back uh, to England. Um, North Koreans are told that uh, Kim Jong-il um, was born in a hut in a remote part of the forest. That's the hut supposedly that he was born in beneath the sacred mountain of Mount Paektu. Uh, as you probably know, he wasn't born in a hut. He was actually born in Russia. And then the sort of the, f the final is this just incredible kind of explosion of color. 100,000 people performing at the bottom, 50,000 of, uh, of teenagers and this huge spectacle. It is a, just the most, um, uh, simply um, one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. Um, and of course, it, it doesn't actually benefit anybody at all. Mm. That's the end of the North Korean section. Yes, well, if we can put the lights up, and if everyone in the room would like to ponder, the microphone will come round. Can I just ask this themic question, uh, Jeremy, not, not to, be, uh, to sound pompous, but the, the, why we've come to watch you is how a festival can explain the DNA of a place. And what comes over to me, astonished and learning so much by your introduction that I've never read, is does this kind of 
cohesion contrast with our own individualism. Like if we had a festival here, it would emphasize perhaps our individuality and we could never get people with a flip chart. Someone would, you know, undoubtedly graffiti it. We celebrate Banksy. And do I see in your talk tonight, not that I'm right, but my question is that you can learn something about a place by its festivals. And this is about uniformity, about young people doing what they are told. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as we will see, um, perhaps in, an, in another couple of examples, um, I mean, they create the image of the, of the apple farm when there actually aren't any apple farms. It's a fantasy world. So these kids are actually, they're being asked to create this extraordinary image they don't know that there isn't an apple farm there. They're told that, 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 that there is, but, but you know, those are sim those, they're, they're simply not available. Likewise, the, the hut where Kim Jong-il was supposedly uh, uh, born, you know, they're inculcated. I mean, they're told you know, from day one that, you know, that the great leader were, you know, came from this sort of little kind of rural background. That's what they're led to believe. So sh can we go over straight away to all the questions? We've got a microphone, just allows everyone to hear, but we won't get too hung up on the technology. But you, if I, you have a name, please use it. Oh, I do have a name, yeah. Um, my name is Lucy Parker. Um, and what I'm interested in is that having travelled a lot around the Soviet Union myself, how easy is it to take photographs in North Korea? Because I noticed your pictures of Pyongyang and the airport. I know that in other dictatorships or former communist countries, it's almost impossible to take pictures of airports, for example. Yeah. Um, I tried to go to North Korea officially. I went to see the uh, the first secretary at the embassy, which is in, in 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 Gunnersbury, and he was a delightful person. And we talked about cameras, and he said, "What's the best camera in the world?" So I said, "Well, it depends, you know, what you want." He said, "Is Canon good?" I said, "Yeah, Canon's fantastic." He said, "I think I'll go out and buy a Canon." Um, he still turned my uh, my application down. Then I found this company in Beijing who would take me in, but they said to me, uh, we can't take you in as a photographer. You've actually got to sign a form saying that you are not a, you're not a photographer. So I said, what, you know, if I go in, what, what can I take? So they said, anything that kind of looks remotely professional will be confiscated. So when you actually arrive at Pyongyang Airport, we flew in rather than going on the train. Um, they go through everything in your bag. They confiscate your camera. They confiscate uh, camcorders. They confiscate GPSs. I took in a camera that looked sort of relatively kind of ineffectual, um, but actually, you know, it, it worked pretty well. It's it's very difficult to photograph there. Um, they you have you have minders with you all the time. You have a good minder and a bad minder. The good minder is actually delightful. The bad minder follows you around behind to make sure that you don't try and, and pinch any shots that you shouldn't have done. But the reality is that you're allowed to go to certain places where there are a lot of North Koreans. Um, behaving in the right way. Behaving in the right way. So here, what was your vantage point here? A stadium for, for onlookers? Um, I, wa I went to my good minder rather than my bad minder and I said, actually, I want to photograph this. Mm. And she said, where would you like to, to, uh, to be? And I said, I want to be right in the middle. And she, she organized it for me. The bad minder perhaps would not have allowed me to do that. Uh, and to you. Um, Jeremy, it says uh, something astonishing to me about photography and about you as a photographer that I want to ask you a question that philosophers and writers and musicians and people, and myself included, uh, wouldn't even, and it comes back to what you were saying. I sat with a Chinese ambassador here just before the Olympics, and I was introducing Ken Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch. And as you know, survival supports the Tibetan Lama. Tip it uh, towards Dalai your Dalai Lama. And, and I had a lot of difficulty about, about a ritual um, a in ways which your photograph photography addresses. In your introduction, you were showing uh, Himalayan mystics and uh, people from ancient expiring traditions. Um, but actually, I mean, you could also say that they're irredentist form of, of this. I mean, this is ritual also. I mean, the fact that these things don't exist doesn't mean it's not ritual. But I, I mean, I, how does, does this in any way nourish these people? I mean, mm. uh, when, when, you, when you... Let's leave it, James, let's leave it there. It, it may I, mean, look I, mean, I may ask 10 more questions. Yeah, I mean, you I may. Yeah, in other words, I mean, um, can you just deal with that first, that first part? Does, is this good for them, even though we're saying, ah, social, they're told what to do? Um, 
when you, go to, when you go to this event, and it happens three times a week during the month of August, and it happens in, in August because it's an outdoor stadium and they get electric storms at other parts of the, of, of the year, and also in winter, of course, it's, it's minus 30 or minus 40. So it only happens at a very specific time. The event is not for us, the, the privileged hundred or so who actually are able to go to this. The event is actually for the local, I mean, the, the, the local people. And so you will get something like, perhaps uh, on the day that I went there, maybe 50,000 who go and you know, and I, when you go outside, outside the stadium, I mean, there's just, it's a sea of buses. And they've all been bussed in from, um, from, from, from the country. I think it's a sort of demonstration by the leadership, you know, that, um, that there's nothing that, that we, the leadership, cannot, cannot create. Uh, and we can put on some of the, you know, the most extraordinary events in the world. But just to answer Paddy's question, which was slightly earlier, um, what we saw here, I, I mean, I think was is probably better than even the Beijing Olympics. Um, I happen to know that uh, for the London Olympics, Danny Boyle is auditioning people at the moment. And one of the things that they're being asked is, can they roller skate? Now, is that an indication of the DNA of the British culture? Yeah, but then it's, it's a fair point. But to answer James's question, does this nourish them? Did you hear ooing? Did you feel joy? Um, I, I think that they are they, they, that they are required to go to it. Um, there is, for instance, I mean, very very close to this, um, there is a fun fair which was built by the Italians, um, and most uh, Korean teenagers, as part of their kind of sort of tiny little salary that they get the opportunity to go to, they get two free tickets a month to go to, um, to the fun fair. Again, I think it's an indication that the regime is simply saying, you know, there's nothing that we cannot put on for you. Okay. We'll come back to your subsequent points, in James. And other questions, this gentleman here. No, I've got the answers. Ask him who are the privileged spectators and just tell me. Okay. Yeah, there, 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 there are no more than, I, I would say 100 was the, the absolute maximum you know, of us that were there, maybe, or, le yeah. maybe less. But the masses are bust in, sort of. The, the masses are bust in. Okay, now does anyone, yes, down to the front. And um, the, the theme of the evening is how festivals show a country uh, in, in its DNA, but there's some specific questions that you might have as well, so please answer. Um, it's just a very specific question. Are these teenagers paid or are they just required to participate? Well, yes. Uh, um, I mean, every, everybody, works for the, everybody works for the state. Um, the average uh, wage is something like uh, $5 a month. And so these kids, I mean, if they weren't um, rehearsing for 10 hours a day, they would probably be working in a factory or working out in the fields. But these kids, they are the elite kids. They come from Pyongyang. They have been, they have demonstrated through their parents, who most certainly are the intellectuals, that they are totally loyal to the regime. So actually, this is a highly prestigious job. Um, with, there's a very, very interesting film that was made um, actually ab ab about this a couple of years ago, um, and they focused on one particular girl. And I mean, she, she felt that the greatest um, privilege that she had was to be in the front row of this possibly performing, possibly performing in front of the, uh, of the, of the great leader. In fact, um, she was then interviewed afterwards, and the great leader, of course, did not turn up to it. And she was bitterly disappointed because she spent uh, something like eight months rehearsing 10 hours a day to perform in this. Uh, like Korean X Factor, we heard from the front. We'll go to the back, and then we'll move on to, uh, to, to another country when the time is right. But please, um, please use your name. My name is Susie Robeson. Um, I wanted to know how would you define an intellectual in a society like? I, I, I'm not sure I can I can can, can answer that question. But I mean, what I, was I mean is, is I, I was I mean I was simply told by 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 the regime that there were three classes, that, or the country has three classes: workers, peasants, and intellectuals. I suspect that the intellectuals are those who are who have had the opportunity to go through a higher form of education um, than either the workers or or, or the peasants. She, the, the, the question said, "Would spout the required dogma?" Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we're all being a bit sniffy, uh, in a way, spouting dogma, you know, doing as they're told. But this is epic. We can't do this. We couldn't do this. No. This isn't in our DNA. Does no. that make them worse, the fact that we can't do as we're told? I mean, did you form any... Did you feel for these teenagers like they'd achieved anything? 
I mean, this is one of the most incredible things that you could see anywhere in the world. It is just, it is truly extraordinary. Um, but it is their job. I mean, they are employed to do it. And it, yes, to this gentleman here, we'll bring a microphone. It just helps a bit, but we won't, we won't get our knickers in the first one. Uh, Kevin Pegley. Um, J Jeremy, um, do, you, do you feel that... Um, I forgot the hell I was going to say, actually. <laughs> um, it's There's a lot of us here. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask, actually, is, is y y uh, just the mechanics of doing this. Y you, yeah. you weren't allowed to be a photographer. Um, but they let you in, and, and what I was gonna, what I was going to say was, um, d was there a sense that 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 I, I'm trying to get my head around why it would be that having put on this spectacle, um, they didn't want the world to see it. Good question. You know, the, that's, the, the, the that's a good question, Jeremy. <laughs> um, they, I think, traditionally that they are paranoid about any kind of, of, um, uh, of a photography in the country, the fact that somebody might misinterpret in some way what they allow you to see. Um, I, 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 it is, I mean, it's something that, is, that, that I know has, has taken place you know, for the last sort of 20 or 30 years because other reporters have been into North Korea and have had equal difficulty. Um, I, I think this is something that you know, that the people you know, should be allowed to see because yeah. it is truly extraordinary. I don't mean to be rude to you because it's a great question, but I know what's coming up. So if I, if I sounded facetious, I don't mean to be. It's a great question. And I'm just, with you, your questions to come, I want to move on, but I'm coming to you next after we see some, some slides about Ethiopia. Yeah. So if we could dim the lights, I know a bit of what's coming, and, and forgive me if I'm, if I'm moving it on. Where are we going now? We're going, we're going to Ethiopia. Um, I was there until about uh, a week ago. In fact, um, Gail, who's sitting in the middle, she came with me, and indeed my wife Ingrid came as well. That's um, just as well, given that Gail came, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, were, we went to an area called the Lower Omo Valley, uh, which is on the border of, of Kenya. Uh, I think this is one of uh, the, the places where cultures are actually going to disappear um, within the next couple of years or so because of the way that technology, particularly mobile telephone technology and all the other related technologies that go with it, are imploding in the country. When I first went to, to this area, which was only four years ago, I was completely out of touch with the world from the moment I arrived. Um, a mobile phone uh, network has been established in the last couple of months. Um, reception is truly incredible. It's almost better than it is in London. Um, and what, what, it, what is happening, therefore, is that suddenly um, people who, certainly when I first went there, as I say, four years ago, were living, I mean, I, I, it's an awful thing to say, but al almost living in the Stone Age, um, now are being subjected to the possibility of, I think, seeing the World Cup um, on, on television um, in, in villages in the, in the next few months. Um, the other uh, worrying thing about this part of the world um, is that uh, they, the Ethiopian government are building a dam on the Omo River. The Omo River is 780 kilometers long. It rises near Addis. As you can see, it's incredibly lush. The river is very high. That's an important uh, point which I'll come to at the moment. The Ethiopian government have built uh, a, a series of dams, Gibi 1, Gibi 2, Gibi 3, and Gibi 4, which has not yet been started. Gibi 3 is under construction. Very important to talk about Gibi 3. Uh, it's a dam that will be one of the largest in Africa. Uh, it's 700 feet high. It's costing 1.6 billion euros. Uh, it was uh, a project that was commissioned by the Prime Minister Zeles. Uh, it never went to tender. It, the contract was given um, piecemeal to an Italian company called Salini. Um, he ignored all environmental issues. There were no planning issues. Uh, he ignored all, all possible um, uh, events that could, could affect the uh, indigenous people who number about 100,000. We went there, as I say, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the river did not look like that. The river had dropped about 60 feet. 
Uh, they've had a terrible drought there. Uh, and a combination of Gibby 1, Gibby 2 working at the moment, Gibby 3 coming into operation uh, probably at the end of this year, and Gibby 4 uh, still to be built, um, is going to affect uh, the livelihoods of the 45 different tri tribal groups who live here, who are all agro-pastoralists. That means that they only survive by growing uh, 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 staple diets like sorghum, and, um, and managing livestock, which includes uh, cattle and, uh, sh and, and, and goats. Uh, as I said, the river here, um, when we photographed it, uh, this is two years ago, uh, the river was flowing at uh, 4,000 cubic meters a second. That is an incredible speed. That is like sort of eight miles an hour. And when we were there two weeks ago, the river was virtually stagnant and had dropped uh, 60 feet. Uh, I'll just get on to tribes in a moment. As I say, there are, there are 45, 45 different groups there. Um, they're all linked um, through the fact that they're agro-pastoralists uh, and indeed through their language. This is their hammer. Um, this is the Morsi. I'm going to get on to that in a moment. Uh, I regret to say that because uh, the Morsi um, who use uh, this labial plate as part of their um, uh, decoration which creates status for them, um, the Morsi are now becoming uh, almost a kind of uh, freak show. It's very, very distressing. And it's distressing because people like me have been there, have photographed them, and have put their images on the website. And as a result of that, um, tourism has absolutely uh, um, grown to such a degree. When I first went there, there were only about 2,000 tourists a year. They're now an estimated 30,000. Uh, this is another Morsi. Um, these women, they, they, they just have a kind of sort of sense of style um, that, um, that you go and say why um, so many of them actually, uh, or from this part of the world, have actually sort of um, come to Europe and become famous models. Um, this is a group called the Caro. The Caro are, are a diminishing group. There are only a thousand of them left. And this is another Karagal. And again, they, 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 these kids are very, very clever. They know, they know how to create these extraordinary images that, mm. that they know we want to photograph. Uh, this is disturbing. Um, the AK-47 has become uh, Africa's weapon of mass destruction. The tribes are continuously fighting amongst themselves. They fight over land. They fight over cattle. Um, a very, very important um, part of this is that for, these, for, for the men, um, if they want to get married, they, um, they have to produce a bride price. Um, the bride price to take a wife is always in the form of cattle. It could be as many as 30 cattle. Very difficult to acquire 30 cattle other than by stealing them. And so they will go and raid another tribe. Um, and if they get caught, um, there will be a fight. Um, there was a tremendous battle a couple of months ago, um, just a little bit further south from where I took this picture. And something like uh, 27 were killed in a couple of hours. Um, AK-47s can be bought um, uh, close to here for $80. And the ammunition is only a dollar a bullet. Um, and frequently, they'll have these jumping ceremonies. And they, they will have a jumping ceremony um, either to celebrate the acquisition of guns or the acquisition of, of more livestock. Uh, one of the things that the Ethiopian government are trying to do is to stamp out some of the practices uh, that are, are performed in this part of Africa. This is part of a ceremony called the Dimi ceremony of a tribe called the Dasinech. Uh, the, the, the girls of the Dasinech um, have to undergo female circumcision. Uh, they're circumcised from, the, from about the age of 12. If they're not circumcised, they are unmarriageable. Um, it's an extremely uh, expensive uh, performance for the parents of the, of the child because they, the parent is required to donate to these elders uh, something like um, nine uh, cows and 36 goats 
for um, during every circumcision. And I met one person, one, one, one gentleman in this tribe. He had eight daughters, um, and therefore that would have been a colossal um, price to pay for to have his um, his, his, his children. Uh, his girls um, circumcised. It's terrible for the girls because they suffer from fistulation, they suffer from incontinence. Supposedly, Ethiopian government are trying to stamp it out. Um, there are American missionaries who've gone in and they're trying to stop it. Um, but for the moment, uh, it will not happen because the children simply are unmarriageable unless they go through that particular performance. And at the end of it, um, there is this uh, absolute terrible slaughter of animals um, and um, they will slaughter, uh, each, each tiny little enclave will slaughter a number of animals and slit the throats and then they will um, drink the blood and it becomes a huge kind of party. Um, indeed. So okay, okay, okay. Um, this is another practice that the Ethiopian government are trying to stop and indeed the church is trying to stop. This is the uh, ceremony of whipping as part of the uh, bull jumping ceremony. You may have seen this uh, um, during Bruce Parry's uh, TV series of Tribe. Um, sadly, he, uh, he only performed the bull jump. He didn't actually show um, the uh, prelude to the bull jump where the women subject themselves to this ritual whipping. The women uh, will be relations of the man doing the whipping. He's called a maz. He has been through a ceremony whereby he has become, he's jumped the bulls and he's become adult. Now that could take place from the age of 14 um, and it will continue on in some cases until they're about 20 or so. The, the girl will subject herself, as you can see here, she's already, I mean, she's, she's got a, a number of, of terrible um, uh, scars on her back from, from previous whippings. But she will subject herself to whipping because in, in later life, it will be a demonstration to her relations in the form of the person doing the whipping uh, that, she's, that she's been able to exercise um, love and devotion to uh, members of her family. And at these ceremonies, I mean, there were the one that we went to two weeks ago, there were probably two or three hundred uh, people there. The reason for that is that, um, that each, each um, uh, family, family group have probably six or seven children. Um, and so you get these actually enormous tribal groups. Um, but whipping is it's, uh, it's pretty awful to see. Um, and I believe that it will continue for the future, but I think the future may only be a couple of years. Um, the women um, encourage the men to, um, to perform the, the ritual whipping. They blow their trumpets, they dance, um, and there will be certain men um, with whom they want to have, uh, with whom they want to be whipped. Um, but it can be pretty violent. Um, and then, of course, they will proudly show off their, their scars at the end of it. And then the bull jump happens. Um, in this case, the, uh, the boy is required to jump. Uh, in this case, there was something like uh, 17 cows, um, and he's required to jump it four times. Um, but once he's done that, then he, and if he does it successfully, he will then become what is known as this maz, so he will be adult. Uh, and at that point, he can um, uh, take a wife if he could afford the bride price. One of the, the, the interesting things which I, we only discovered on this trip um, is that um, the hammer required that all children should um, be with married couples. If uh, by chance, a couple who are not married um, produce a child. That child is called a mingi, uh, and uh, that 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 child um, will be um, considered to be um, an outcast of the tribe. And within a few hours of the child being born, it will either be killed or it will have earth stuffed into its mouth, where it, and it will be left out in the open and fed to the hyenas. 
uh, we went to one town where we were able to find an adoption center and they are going out of their way to find these Mingi children uh, literally on day one and um, they, it's, a, it's an absolutely incredible um, uh, facility at the moment. It's being funded from the States uh, and they're able to get some of these children adopted, um, in fact, by families in, in, in the States. But if you're a Mingi, um, the future is, 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 is bleak. Um, the Morsi has become a circus because you've got to remember with these tribes they have no way they have no way of earning an income. They are pastoralists, so they, they simply have they simply have animals and they grow sorghum, which is their staple diet, so kind of porridge. Um, and but they but the sorghum is only used for their own resources. And where you have the river and it's dropping by the by the minute. Um, the future, I think, is, is again looking uh, very, very distressing. And so what happens with the Morsi is that they go out of their way to, um, to, to want to be photographed um, with these labial plates. What is interesting, and I, again, we, I didn't discover it until this last visit, um, they have no mirrors. And so when we photograph them, they want to see their photograph on the back of the camera. And if you photograph a group, they will very often point to other members of the group, but they won't point to themselves because they've never actually seen themselves. So they don't actually know what they look like. Wow. Um, people ask why they, they have these plates. Well, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a status. Um, the bigger the plate, um, the higher up the social uh, class they rise. Uh, they only keep the plate in when men are around. They take them out. Uh, Really worrying. It's a circus. Um, they take them out uh, to eat and drink. It's very, very difficult for them because, of course, um, the bottom lip is usually a seal. And so, if you imagine trying to drink with with no bottom lip, you would actually have to put your head back and uh, and just pour the liquid down. So, d d sorry to interrupt. Do we understand? It's just the women who have those. It's only the women. It's only the women. And the other thing that, uh, that they are famous for is this scarification. Um, again, this is a, a sign of their status. The more uh, scarification they have, the higher up the social ladder they go. Um, this is actually a, a boy who's just um, uh, subjected himself to, uh, to having additional uh, scarification. Almost certainly, he will have killed somebody because uh, the, the level of scarification that he has is indication that he has taken the life of somebody else. If there are any photographers in the room, this is quite interesting because actually this is taken on a Holger. The Holger is, is, is the successor to the Kodak Box Brownie. Uh, they're made in China, they cost 20 pounds, they're made of plastic and they're held together with bits of tape. Um, but they produce these uh, extraordinary images mm. that no digital camera um, at the moment can produce. She's probably, uh, she's probably about 13, I suppose. Um, but uh, she has already demonstrated that she's, um, she's rising up the ranks. Um, when, I went, when I was last there, which is two years ago, um, there was no sign of Jesus having arrived. Uh, Jesus has definitely arrived now. Um, the missionaries are there. Uh, baptisms are taking place. And, and I think that, um, that this will continue at a, at a, a much faster pace. And I think that, that um, uh, very soon uh, they will um, no longer be animists and they will be brought into the church. And at that point, um, I think that some of these practices, uh, particularly the circumcision of the, of the, of the girls and indeed the uh, scarification and the cutting of the lower lip um, is all likely to change. And literally just a couple of miles away in a place called Jinka, um, which is the center of the Omo, um, you've got 5,000 who have already been baptized. This actually was uh, something called Timcat. It's the celebration of Epiphany. Um, and um, and uh, acculturation has already taken place there. And this is literally just a few miles away from, uh, from, from the areas of the, of, the, of the real tribal people. Now, um, again, coming to everyone in the room, uh, whilst we're putting the lights up. Can I, uh, can I thank you again for uh, opening my eyes? I'm, I don't know if I'm speaking for anyone else in the room. I'm, I'm a bit gobsmacked. One, one of the things I hear from you is the first time you've, you've opened the, uh, the, the, the witness part of your work. In other words, 
you go to a place and you spoil it. Equally, you hate the, I suspect, the mutilation of women. And on the other hand, you destroy a culture by taking a photograph of it, and uh, people, in, people will be familiar with this dilemma. You've raised it very honestly. Will you tell me bluntly, do you hate the fact that you spoil a culture by photographing it and bunging it on the website, having a bunch of old chatterers in London to look at it? And do you also hate this culture that mutilates and debases women? Are those two very strong parts of your work? OK. Um, the, the thing about uh, other parts of Ethiopia um, is that um, there's a the considerable kind of coffee growing. Uh, I'll, come, I'll answer your question in a slightly roundabout way. Um, the coffee growers at the moment are getting something like 4p, 4 pence, a kilo for coffee. That is, they have to grow it, they have to nurture it, and they have to harvest it. And they get 4p a kilo. They went, uh, about a, a year ago, um, there was a group in Addis, and they went to the coffee cartel, and they tried to get the price of coffee raised. They wanted 7p a kilo. It got turned down. Um, so you can imagine the amount of work that goes, goes into earning 4p a kilo of, of coffee. When we go to these villages, we pay them. Um, they have no other means of actually earning any money. Now, we will pay them actually 5p and sometimes 10p. Um, I personally don't have a problem with, with, with that because um, they, have no, they have no other means of, 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 of earning an income. The downside of that is that, they, that it becomes almost a kind of freak show. Uh, one village we went to of the Morsi, at 8 o'clock in the morning, there were 14 jeeps there. Of people with cameras from the outside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because, because I'm afraid that we are all sensationalists and we want, to go, we, you know, we want to go and visit these freak shows. Let me interrupt my own question because it's a public meeting and, and the, I interrupted you early on. So we'll, we'll come, could we pass the microphone to the two people here who I interrupted earlier? Do use your name. You're, you're first and you had your question. I interrupted you last. So. Uh, my name is Rupert Gray. Um, uh, and Jeremy, you didn't answer his question. <laughs> And his question, can I interpret your question or put a spin on it? And, and do add your own. Um, uh, well, the, the, mine is this, and it's the same as yours, but I can put a spin on it. You use the word witness. Witnesses that, uh, in our society are, is mainly a sort of quasi-legal concept, and their role is to report what they've seen truthfully. Now, photojournalists are in an interesting position on that, on that front, because they're a witness in a broader sense. Most of you photojournalists or even, in, I might include myself in that up to a point, um, are actually partisan. We choose what we shoot. We select what's in the frame, we select the time we click the shutter, and then we edit it later, particularly digitally, we can stream out the things that don't say what we want them to say. Now, where do you stand in this, Jeremy? Are you the legal witness who speaks the truth, or are you the partisan photojournalist witness, like the great Magnum photographers, let's say, for a second example? Where do you stand? Certainly, of the, with the villages that, 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 that I go to in, in Ethiopia, they are not aware that, that we, I, or anybody else I might be with are, are going there. They, they have already, they, they already have used body painting. They've used scarification. In the case of the Morsi, they have, um, they've already, they, they keep their label plates in. Um, we go there and we photograph what they are showing us. Um, if I, I, mean, I, I don't know if I've actually answered the question. Um, it, it, they're not, they are not, they're not putting it on for us. They know that they live in a part of the world that people go and visit. And they know, historically, that if they, if they use body painting and these other things, that they will that they will be of interest to anybody who might pass through. And because of the fact that they have no opportunity to earn any other income other than from the sale of their cattle or the, or the, or the, the, um, the, the remote possibility they might sell some of their grain, this is, this is, this is a way of earning, of earning income for them. And to and the, sorry, to the lady next to you, we, we will keep it going, yes? Okay, well, it's just a... You have to just point it at your mouth, I beg your pardon. And, and, 
Um, well, it's a continuation, really, of the same question. Uh, do not feel, then, that, we, that it will end up, as I've seen in other tribal cultures, that the, the people are continuing with these rituals or these performances simply to attract the tourists or for us yes. rather than... That's fine. I mean, I don't know why they do it, uh, their real reason originally, but it changes, doesn't it? And then it becomes right. a performance. I, uh, yes, I mean, I think in I think in the case of the Morsi, um, that they know that their 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 practice of cutting their lip is of very very great interest to um, to, to anybody who might you know who who might visit them, but it is they don't I mean they don't put it on for us. It is something that they do in any case, but the fact is that we we as a group go and see them. And, and sometimes they amplify the way that they have that lip plate in, and so they will take the, sometimes they will take the plate out and they might, put a, uh, they might put a cup in there. And as you saw, one extraordinary picture actually was taken by my wife, um, where you have this, this Morsi woman, and she's actually put her hands through her bottom lip. Yeah. Now, she knows that actually that's going to, you know, it's so extraordinary. It's, it is a freak show, but she does it because she needs the income. OK, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up later to you here, and then you two there. I, I should have said before, I'm, I'm on the board of Survival International, as, as she. As she. You, you've actually focused in on a debate that took us for two and a half hours at the last board meeting here, because the Pentecostalists in Brazil are trying to impugn survival as supporting female circumcision and uh, all the rest of it, um, and, and to, to, in fact, Christianize them. And I mean, the way the photographs worked here, the, the Christian church with these rather empty visions that they were carrying around in the valley, uh, it was rather like the communists. I mean, it, 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 it eviscerates the local culture. Uh, how would you, who have seen both sides of it, you seem very adamantly on the side of the Christian church uh, in, at that moment. I mean, would you want to defend these cultures or would you just say, let them go to the Christian church? Um, I'm, 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 I'm not defending the, the, the church at all. I mean, the, the, the reality is that, that with, the, with, with the Dasanich, for instance, um, that at the moment, those, those young girls are simply unmarriageable unless they go through that particular practice. If they don't marry, they're actually, they actually become outcasts. They, they, they cannot survive. They've got to, you know, they, they actually have to have, they've got to have a kind of family unit. And the only way that eventually they can become a family unit, marrying, have children, is in fact to go through that practice. Um, I think with, uh, that if the church um, is able to come in and in fact create some, some, some schools and they begin you know, to understand that there is a different way of living their lives, then I think it's a practice that perhaps will, you know, over a period of time, start uh, diminishing. And there's lots of questions, and you, you raised this topic yourself of, of, of doubt about your, your role, so it's great. I'm glad you're raising it, and we'll come to the closing point. Sorry, I've given the microphone to you by mistake. Would you pass it to the boy, and then you, as, uh, as the woman, can have it? <laughs> um, just in truth, I mean, just to drag it back to what we would do, people have just kind of in some ways put you on the spot with, which is in light of recent news events of um, supposedly, well, to use the media term, um, get on with it in light of Uncontacted life. tribes. Um, you're in a position, obviously, where you're going to photograph people, tribes that have already been photographed. And as you say, they, they in some ways pander to the tourism aspects. As you say, they can make money of it. In your position as someone who's been there and done that, and as you say, you don't necessarily have a problem with that. How would you feel if you were given the opportunity to go and take a photograph of an uncontacted tribe, in inverted commas? Right, OK. And effectively start the ball rolling when you know what the end product might become? Thanks. And do pass it on. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm uncomfortable about that. I'm very uncomfortable about seeing the way that the Morsi have developed themselves into this kind of sort of freak show. Um, I... I, I I'm party to the fact that, that that I'm you know responsible for for acculturation of these people. Um, it, but if I wasn't there, somebody else would be doing it. So I, it, I, it does disturb yeah. me. It does yeah. disturb me. And also, I made the point, and other people nodded that we've never seen things. Like, some of us have never seen things like this. I don't know if you have, but we're just moving around the room to you, and then we're going to the middle of the room. Thanks. Um, okay, you say that you, they're using their culture to impress and gain money. But do you feel that they're open to um, the future and westernized skills? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, my wife, who came with me, I mean, she, she actually, we were in one village, and she gave her camera 
to a group of kids who had never been given anything like that before. Within a matter of minutes, they completely under these kids don't go to school because there are no schools there. But within seconds, these kids had got the hang of the camera. They were laughing around. They were photographing each other. Um, I think that if they, was, if they were able to, to go to school, I think very, very quickly they would realize that there was, a, you know, there was another world out there. It's a world that doesn't require female circumcision. It doesn't require cutting of the, of the plate of the lower lip. It doesn't require this terrible scarification. Um, I, w I mean, both of us were absolutely astonished by how quickly mm. these kids grasped the technology. But, uh, uh, and, and and I as I said a moment uh, at the beginning, mobile phone technology has just arrived there. It's only going to be, a, I mean, it could happen within the next year that suddenly their life is changing. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're going to take a couple of questions. I'd just like a question for everyone in the room, including me. Are we happier with the world that Jeremy presented where we were banned as witnesses and we feel uh, somehow justified if we're banned and we go into a place that's but if we're not banned and we go and expose a culture which reveals itself in a vulnerable way we feel very challenged as people in this room i wonder if that shows your mirror back at us our dna is to go to north korea where we're banned and to display these hapless teenagers with this uniformity uh, but we feel that in a way sorry for them and then we come to this culture and we question your role once we realize you're displaying their vulnerability. I think that, if I may say, I, 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 deserve, I, 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 I can feel something coming from the questioning that I hope we get time to talk about. But your question's next, and we will move on to another country, and we'll, we'll keep trying to give everyone in the room. OK. Um, I, I'm Patrick Cunningham. Um, next to me is my wife, Sue Cunningham. I have to explain this because it's relevant to the question. We spent six months in Brazil visiting 48 tribal villages. Um, in a boat, so w that's where we come from. My question to you is, what is your motivation in taking these photos? Um, I've, yeah, I mean, right at the beginning, um, the, the, whole, the whole, if you like, archive of work is called Let's Celebrate, exploring the DNA of the world's cultures through their festivals, rituals, and celebrations. So, so my, my um, uh, my role has been, in fact, to record these um, over a period of 35 years, uh, and I'm recording what you know, what I, what I, what continues to happen. Um, so, actually, it's a kind, of, it's a, it's a, a piece of historical and archival material uh, that I think will have a place in the future because I think many of these things, as I said earlier, I think will not. Uh, exist um, within a, a very short space of time. So that's, so that's the reason why I've taken them. So you're, that's your role, but it's not actually your motivation. Do I understand your motivation is the desire to record something for, for posterity, for absolutely history? Absolutely right, absolutely right. So, um, so um, because our motivation was, was somewhat different. I mean, we, we were there um, because we feel that, 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 um, that tribal um, values are, are different but have an equal validity. You seem to be saying that this culture somehow ought to be assimilated, that these people ought to be given the benefits of education. You don't look at the negative side of education. I'm sorry, I don't look at the negative side of it. Yes, the negative side of education. For example, on a very simplistic level, well, if, you, if you teach somebody who has an oral tradition to read and write, they lose a lot of the facility to uh, recall things and to pass things on orally. I, I, mean, from what I, I mean, from my experience, I think that um, particularly the children who I've come across they really want, I mean, they really want to, to learn. Uh, I mean, the fact that you can give them, you know, a bit of modern technology in the form of a camera, and within seconds they have completely assimilated, they completely understand it, suggests to me that they have the ability um, to, to, you know, to move on from a tribal culture towards um, a, a life that they may find um, is less... Um, um, you know, has, has fewer issues than, than, than they have at the moment. And that is, you know, that they have, I mean, they, particularly in Ethiopia, I mean, they're, 
survival is very difficult because you know there's this terrible drought. The river, uh, the, the level of the river is dropping. It means that some of their staple crops will perhaps not be able to be grown in the next in the in the coming period of time. They want to be able to move on. And I think that last image where you have um, uh, the festival of, of Timcat taking place in Jinka, and you've got 5,000 uh, gathering there who will have come from the tribal areas during the past couple of years suggest to me that actually education is a route for them. So we'll come to these issues as we go on. And also, just one thing that I wanted to ask before we move on to the next country is, your slides began with the river. And Ethiopia, in one's mind, is the lack of water. And I wondered if that part of your, although this is about festivals, it, did you also feel very um, affected by the resources, the nature, which is part of the question here, I think, the human nature, but did you feel the question of, you, to, to, de to start us off with water was important to you to demonstrate a country that often suffers well, a lack of it? Um, uh, the, the, on my last evening in, 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 in Ethiopia, um, I was introduced to somebody who, who was a um, deputy ambassador of, of one of the embassies in, in, in Addis, and they said to me that, they felt that Ethiopia was going to be next in line uh, to be part of the um, Arab Spring or the Jasmine Revolution or whatever you like to call it, because of the fact that there is, I mean, there is massive corruption as we've seen in the form of the, the Gibi Dam, which is not going to benefit Ethiopia. In fact, when the power uh, is generated at full level, at full capacity, it will actually be sold on to Yemen, uh, Somalia, and Djibouti, so it will not actually benefit Ethiopia. It will only benefit the, the Prime Minister. So there's rampant, there's rampant corruption, there is rampant unemployment. Um, in August uh, 2011, somebody estimated that 67% of the country was unemployed. Uh, the median age level in Ethiopia is just 16. Um, it is ripe for revolution, and it could happen again very, very soon. Well, we have to come to some of these issues because they're all linked with what your question and, and some of your extraordinary images. So we, we, I think we've probably got time, uh, it's an awful thing to say, to move to Papua New Guinea because I'm quite sure that is a week of our own, but I know many people in the room are interested. So if we try and do slides and some more questions and make time for closing themes from everyone in the room. Um, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed. If you, uh, how are you doing? I'm fine. Good. Yeah. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot to have to do. So yeah. Let me had, just. We've had ask questions. You slow down. Questions. You speed up. So just take us to Papua New Guinea in your own time. Uh, Papua New Guinea is 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 another country uh, like Ethiopia that is changing by the minute. Again, uh, mobile phones have uh, have taken over. There is a huge network there, um, and uh, even in the uh, remote tribal areas. Um, they are actually communicating through the, the new technology. The interesting thing about Papua New Guinea is the way that uh, is, is really the DNA of, of, the, of the, the tribal people. Um, a, uh, a boy is called an axe when he's born, a girl is called a spade, and uh, pubescent boys go to wig school uh, where they are educated by a wig master. Right. And this is the wig master. I'm sorry, your, your microphone's falling off. Sorry. So I'm just going to... Flora, will you pin the yeah. Thank God for photographs. That's what everyone's saying at this time. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. There is actually a similarity um, between the way that uh, that uh, a tribe called the Huli live, and indeed uh, some of the tribes uh, in in Ethiopia. And that is that uh, again, they have very very difficult um, uh, times in in terms of earning any money, um, particularly uh, if they want to get married. Um, and this is a, a, a boy who's probably about uh, 17 or 18, and he goes to wig school. And at wig school, he learns about the problems of manhood and particularly the relationship between men and women, um, because the one thing that uh, they are educated about is that uh, menstruating women are so evil that they have to be cast out from the village centers. Um, 
in order to get married, the boy will re be required to uh, produce a bride price of a certain number of pigs, because pigs, uh, as opposed to cattle, are the staple diet. And so one of the ways that they're able to earn the money uh, to, to actually get married is to create a wig. Now, that wig uh, will have taken him probably uh, two years to grow. It's actually, it's his own hair, but it's actually on a bamboo frame. Uh, and for many of them, they will spend the time at wig school not only learning about uh, the problems of menstruating women, but also the fact that they're able to earn, earn the bride price by growing their hair, converting it into a wig, and then selling it on to somebody, to another man who can't spend the time or can't afford the time to grow his own hair. Um, this, is a, this is an indication of the value of pigs. Um, the, the man on the right, uh, he's a village elder, and the necklace that he has um, contains a number of bamboo sticks. And those bamboo sticks indicate the number of pigs that he owns, so he's extremely wealthy. And actually, he's got, uh, he's got four wives there. Um, the the Huli, they are the principal group in, in Papua New Guinea who lead completely separate lives uh, from their women. Um, the thing about the Huli is that they never have recreational sex. Um, they, they live completely separate lives from the women. The women are in one part of the village in their own huts. The men are in another village. And um, for procreation, they go into what is called the garden. Every little village has a, an area um, where they grow sweet potatoes, which is their staple diet. Uh, in Ethiopia, the staple diet is sorghum. In Papua New Guinea, it's, um, it's sweet potatoes. And pigs are put into the garden where they, um, they nose around and they actually act as a kind of hoe. Um, and they're constantly sort of hoeing the ground. It makes it very, very fertile. And they're able to get about um, three harvests of sweet potatoes a year. And for uh, procreation, they will simply go into, th into the garden. Um, they will meet their wife there. And um, it will be uh, something that takes place very, very rapidly. Um, the, um, th when they're at wig school, they have to um, rinse their hair uh, every, uh, every day in the, um, in the sacred stream. And whilst they're there, they're told all the things they must do. They must water their hair 12 times a day. Uh, they must wear the bamboo hair frame at all times. They must drink magic water from the bamboo pipes, pipes which you've just seen. Um, they, <laughs> interesting, they may not look at, speak to, or touch a woman. Um, they must hunt possums um, for their wig decoration. They must memorize huli law. Uh, and right at the bottom, they must make sure the pigs don't get sunstroke because the, <laughs> the pigs are their, are, are their lifeblood. Um, and when the women um, are menstruating, they're cast away into a completely separate part of the village, and the men will not allow uh, the woman to walk anywhere near them. Uh, the woman may not walk on any um, part of the earth that the men walk on, and the men will not touch any cooking utensil that the woman has used. Uh, menstruation is the most evil of all uh, parts of holy life. As you can see, um, pigs are the staple lifeblood of the community. Um, this is an interesting uh, uh, part. Um, this is called bigmanship. Um, as in Ethiopia, um, where you have rival tribes um, raiding each other uh, for, their, um, for, for their cattle. In, in Papua New Guinea, something called bigmanship existed for, for, for centuries. Um, and uh, bigmanship was all about creating uh, a kind of impression of power. And this is a, this is a, a group um, who, uh, over centuries past, they would they would raid other parts of of their uh, of their tribal areas uh, with these um, uh, masks and bamboo uh, extended fingers, and they would always raid at night. And because of the fact that um, uh, they, you know they looked uh, sort of pretty evil, um, the, ra the, uh, the other tribal areas believed that the spirits were had, had descended upon them from heaven, and uh, that they were going to be kind of annihilated by this group. 
And so this was something that they used to do for, for, for centuries. Um, and it continues today um, that the, uh, the, the government actually are trying to encourage the tribes to fraternize with each other. And so they hold something called um, a Sing Sing, which is a tribal gathering, whereby they will actually invite uh, tribal groups who in, um, in the past have actually been enemies to come together and, uh, and celebrate uh, as a community. Uh, and you will get um, these sort of, again, this is sort of bigmanship. Um, this would have been a group, again, who in, in, in the past would have uh, descended upon a village at night to attack it um, and, uh, and obviously put the fear of God into uh, those that they were um, um, accessing. And today, um, that, um, that makeup, uh, body painting, again, is very much like Ethiopia. It's a very important part of their life. Um, and the, the more, uh, the more uh, body paint they use, the, the bigger the necklaces, is, uh, again, gives them uh, status in their village. And uh, one of the things that they continue to do, and they have done for the last 40,000 years, um, is to um, kill birds of paradise there. And these extraordinary headdresses are headdresses that have been utilized and passed down through the centuries um, with, uh, with the feathers of birds of paradise. And again, it's all to do with bigmanship. It's, it's being able to demonstrate to your neighbor that you're more powerful than him by the way that you portray yourself through your body painting and your headdress. There we go. Right. Well, now, um, whilst we wait for questions to you, uh, I wonder if I can uh, ask a question of our previous uh, questioner. And I think you're a, a, a Cunningham. And next to you is another Cunningham. And you expressed a sort of different, you wanted to explore with Jeremy a difference of, you know, you were wondering about his motives and yours. Could I ask you, Patricia Cun Sue. Sue, sorry, Sue. It's like, it's like Alzheimer's. Sue, Sue Cunningham. When you are coming from a, a perspective that wants to celebrate a culture and you find women in some way either mutilated through the circumcision process or debased in other ways through the methods that we've seen, and, and Jeremy's been explaining the menstruation ceremony and his talk is about festivals, do you find you, you have a difference from, I imagine, your husband? in the way that you view things? Because all of us are coming with our own perspectives, and that's part of the evening. Do you find that you and he sometimes come away, and he says, well, that was absolutely marvelous. And you say, well, I'm not quite sure if I like the way they bash the women over the head with a, bab with a baboon skin every evening. You know, what, what would you comment on that? I spent 25 years with the Kayapo in the Amazon. The woman rules. So that's that's why I'm you went there. From. You're an Amazonian. That's but can you answer the point I'm trying yes, to make? Yes, I am. So our, our differences are very, very um, narrow, minute. Really, we do see the world very much in the same light. Um, there are women in Africa that I've met who have suffered circumcision or their children are about to, and I can't keep my mouth shut. I'm a photographer. I sent, spend most of my time saying it with images. But sometimes I just can't shut up. You're angry. Oh, God, yes. And so I do speak to the men. And I do say, look, do you know that a woman has no pleasure when she's circumcised? Wouldn't you prefer to be the man that gives her pleasure? You know, and try, well, do. So try to give her some other way of, you know, looking yep. at it. But it's interesting. So as one questioning couple in the room, you've exposed how these questions come out from, uh, from so I'm grateful to you for responding because Jeremy, it's interesting to me that one of the things you do explore is the women and men role in the festivals. And uh, this is a question that I'm interested in, and, and, but the time is tight. So I'd just like to go around the room, but we'll give you time for closing comments. And can I ask you if you haven't raised things that you wanted to have explored, if you'd like to do it now, because obviously there's so much to say. And now, you, you, why are you shaking your head now, I wonder? Yeah. Yeah. Millions of questions. No, quite right. We're, we're all in that position, but it's a public meeting. So would anyone else like to raise something? And then we'll, we'll come to some closing comments. Right. OK, everyone's been uh, b beaten into submission. Um, I like to end meetings on time, and so there's only, a, there's only five minutes. 
Jeremy, we've heard different themes in the room, questioning about whether or not you're tinkering with cultures that you should not, questions about the role of men and women. Uh, and bluntly, my eyes, as a, re as a reading person, opened by your photographs. And I saw lots of other people nodding about what we'd learned. Do you, do you feel the, the, the doubt or the certainty from your, your pictures? Do you, do you feel it's right? And yes, there are questions raised. Or do, do you feel that you do it because you know it's right to do it? If you could talk about the, the whole theme of the evening, festivals, and, and how we can learn about a culture from them. Um, yes, I mean, uh, that, I, I mean, I believe that, um, you know, that every festival and celebration I've been to, you know, it has a, you know, there's kind of sort of myth and legends attached to it. There's color and sound. Uh, there's sort of drama and music. And the entire culture can be encapsulated sometimes, um, you know, in a, in, in, in a ritual that can take place in a couple of minutes, a couple of hours, or indeed, you know, over a couple of days. So, I mean, the theme of what I've been doing over the last years is actually demonstrating that a celebration, you know, encapsulates a culture um, as an entity in a very, very short space of time. That's really been the, you know, the whole kind of um, sine qua non of, 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 of this project. And the festivals that we've seen and that we've debated, are they me in many cases dying out? Whatever we think about your role in photographing them, would you like to tell us all in the room that they are fading? Um, well, I, let me just give you an example. I mean, we haven't, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's 65, there's 65 um, countries that I've been to. There's one incredible uh, celebration I went to in, in Tibet. Um, I mean, as we know, that there have been uh, problems between the, um, uh, the Chinese and Tibetans because, of course, you know, the, the, the Han are the ruling class in, in, in China. And when you go to Tibet now, in fact, the Han have taken over the running of, the, you know, the running of all the kind of commercial activities there. The, the, the celebration that I've been to, in fact, I've been to it four times, is in a place called Lebrang. Uh, Lebrang is, is the center of a Buddhist group called the Yellow Hat Sect. Um, and uh, I have a friend whose son uh, has been living there, and she told me last week that the, Chinese, that the event, actually, the big celebration, which is called the Great Monlam Festival, which celebrates the uh, Tibetan New Year, which actually is always around sort of uh, February because it's um, guided by the lunar cycle. Chinese army have been in there, and they, they are resident there, and they're actually trying to stamp out the whole thing. Um, it is an extraordinary event um, where you get um, uh, 2,000 monks participating. But because of the way that, the, that China is trying to bring Tibet back into you know, the, the fold, and they're doing all they can to actually stop it. And so, so many of these things that I've been to, they will, over a period of time, and I think that time is actually diminishing. I think in many cases, some of these things that I've had the very great privilege to witness will have disappeared, I think, within a um, maximum of 10 years. Certainly in Ethiopia, I think most of those um, rituals that we've been looking at will have gone within five years through uh, the um, expansion of the church. Um, and through the expansion of mobile telephony, which will obviously change the way that people live. And finally, if you were to start in the UK demonstrating our culture, and it's obviously made up of many different nations and different uh, ethnicities, what would be a festival in the UK you'd like to photograph and take to a foreign audience? Oh, um, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah. Oh, well, actually, would anyone in the room like to suggest them? And then would you like to answer it? But anyone? Bonfire night. Bonfire night. Bon Carnival. Carnival. The Notting Hill. Carnival. Car yeah, Bus yeah, yeah. Buskers. Trooping of the Colour. Trooping of the Colour. Cheese rolling. Cheese rolling. Royal weddings. Royal weddings. You're all mad. Um, so, like, completely, maybe completely disparate. We're all mentioning. Di anyone else, perhaps? Christmas Day swims in the sea. <laughs> or heaven day forbids in the serpentine. Strictly come dark. Strictly come dark. <laughs> Village face.
I've asked people there, so I've asked seeing things in articles and so on, and the, some people will tell you some things, some people tell you another. Yeah. But part of it is supposed to be that they chase someone and throw them into the sea. And they say that they learned the songs from a passing slave ship, but you know, that, asks, that puts up a lot of questions about English culture. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, and, 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 and the Viking one festival came. Before, just give me the name again. Uh, it's known as Darky Day, but they know, it's now yeah. often called Mummer's Day. It, okay, right. so and the, uh, Viking festival came from the back. So, what's your own answer to a UK festival? Well, there's an, another incredible festival I went to, which is it, which takes place um, uh, in Cambridgeshire near near the Peterborough, and it's called the Straw Bear Festival. And there they they worship a a bear that is actually created out of straw, um, and um, he's paraded around the town uh, for two days, and then he's ritually burnt. Um, and that is a, actually, it's, it's all part of a kind of sort of uh, festival of, 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 of agriculture and harvest. Um, and, and you offer it up as well. Well, look, I'm sorry, but I'm a very strict uh, person. I like to begin on time and end on time, and I'm a minute late. But you have got us going, and frankly, just personally speaking, you've educated me, but also we've enjoyed poking you, those of us who disagree with you. And we've Thank you. it's been a fabulous evening prompted by images. You're, I know, because I've met you 20 years ago, all you want to do is hold a camera and point it up, and you've shown us some of this. And if I may say, just listening, we know you care hugely about taking photographs, and it's possible you'll never be able to leave the room. Uh, Jeremy Hunter, uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, for, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you.